Well, hello. Today, I thought I would take a moment to make a video on something that I find particularly interesting. And that is an early mechanical clock movement. This particular clock is known as a BOTT clock, B-O-T-T. -T. You can see the name there and the logo of something I'm not quite sure what that is. This is made approximately 1970, give or take, and is apparently a replica of an earlier design that was uh, used somewhere. Um, information I've been able to turn up on this particular clock is a little bit sketchy. Uh, there's information out there, but a lot of it seems to be second and third hand and not necessarily reliable. However, it is still an interesting specimen, and that's the reason I bought it. So this is a clock with, as you can see, wooden gears. It is open and exposed, and all the workings are available to be observed. This is what is termed a verge and foliot clock. It is one of the earliest clock mechanisms that was used after the simple gravity or fire clocks. Gravity being a uh, uh, measured amount of water or sand, a fire being the burning rate of a candle or something like that of a particular size. Um, all fairly unreliable, but suitable for measuring short intervals like your, your typical hourglass. In this particular case, what we have you'll notice is a pair of weights, a driving weight and a counterweight. Otherwise, you know, the rope would just slide all the way through and would not do anything. So you need to have something to keep tension as the clock is drawn, as the length of the rope is drawn through the clock. Now you'll notice that this is something of a German style Roman numeral setting. You'll also notice that this clock only has one hand. That is the hour hand. The reason for that is that these clocks are notoriously poor timekeepers. Uh, they'll tell you approximately what time it is, but it's always going to be with a certain degree of error. So... You can't rely on this sort of movement to give you the exact minute because of the inherent weaknesses in it. Now let me show you a little bit about how this works. So what we have here, this is called the foliot. If you look around the side here, you will see the pins and these little metal pieces grabbing onto them. That is what is known as the verge. The little metal plates there are what are termed pallets. So you have an upper pallet, which is the technically termed the entry pallet because the gear is turning towards it. A pin enters the range of the verge and then travels down to the bottom until it hits the exit pallet, which then clears it away from the verge. So we have the rope here hanging over a pulley. And this particular mechanism, there is a ratchet attached to it. Uh, it can't exactly be seen here. I think it's better viewed from the other side. Let's see that here. We pull on this bit. And you can see that these two gears are not linked unless that ratchet is pushing against this other gear here. So... This is the main wheel, also called the first wheel, the great wheel. This particular clock is very simple. It does not have any sort of a chime attached to it. So it's what clockmakers refer to as a time-only movement. And being, as being such, it's very, very simple. You have the main wheel here. You have the center wheel, or the second wheel in this particular case. And then you have the escape wheel, or third wheel. Now, normally, this wheel here, the center wheel, would be what drives the, what you see up front. So this would be called the time train or the going train. And this here 
is what's called the motion works, what actually displays the time. So that takes care of actually handling the timekeeping, and this turns it into something that we can interpret. In this particular case, it's very interesting because you see this big fat gear here, and then these little pins, which form essentially, they are a gear, but they form essentially one half of what would otherwise be called a lantern gear. And you could at that point then call these pins trunnions associated with that gear. Now this works perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this design. However, what we're seeing here is the back side of the great wheel. So it is the great wheel that is directly driving the motion works. I find that particularly interesting. Now, the way the virgin foliate system works is that we have a weight on this side of the rope here pulling down on this gear, which if the clock won't shift, which then meshes with a pinion in between, which meshes with a pinion on the back of the center wheel, which then meshes with a pinion on the back of the escape wheel. So this great wheel drives the center wheel, which drives the escape wheel. And what this is doing is it's putting an impulse into the folia here. Now, in th if you've ever seen a 400-day or so-called anniversary clock, then you'll recognize immediately what you're seeing here. It is precisely that mechanism, just a little bit less refined. So this ends up being a torsion pendulum. And the weight here, the distance from the center, you can see the little notches that are used to adjust the position of the weight and therefore what's called the moment of inertia. These are exactly the same thing you find in a torsion clock. Now up here, I have a piece of braided fishing line I've tied into a loop to suspend the virgin foliate. If you look here on the back, you'll notice the bottom of the, of the verge pin here is going through a guide bearing. It's not really a bearing, but uh, it's free floating, it's suspended. It's not resting on anything. So this being the case, all the relevant principles of a torsion clock apply. Meaning that the rate, you can think of this as the suspension spring that you would find on a 400 day clock. So the material that you use here and the length will represent a spring constant. And that refers to how easily the material twists in response to the pendulum movement. So, if I want to make this spin a little bit faster, and I believe I do, what I might do is, instead of using a full loop like this, tie a loop on each end, not a knot, but a loop so I can adjust the position of the knot so that it's straight down and not pointing off to one side, and have only a single strand, which would turn much more easily. Because as it stands, the way this particular clock setup is operating right now, this is keeping pretty good time, but it's fairly close to the limit of the adjustment that I can make on the position of the weight. I'm not necessarily really comfortable with that. Uh, the other thing about this is that this is a direct drive. So the, the, there's no multiplier here between the spring, or spring, the rope and weight and the rest of the works. So that means that you have to have a fairly tall area. And if you 
Note that that clock is about 10 inches tall, and you can get an idea that the whole thing here is about four feet. Now, you'll notice that the two weights are at equal position, meaning if I, this clock is halfway through its cycle. If I were to pull the weight all the way up, the driving weight all the way up, the bottom weight would be resting on the floor or the counterweight would be resting on the floor. So that is one limitation of this clock. Now one way I could change that would be to put an anchor here and take the rope, attach it here, and then put, a, put the weight on a pulley, which would then uh, pull the rope through at half the distance. However, the pulley would now be pulling here and here, or the weight would now be putting tension here and here. And the weight will affect the rate of the clock. So for example, if I pull down on the counterweight to virtually reduce the weight of the, the driving weight, the mass of the driving weight, you'll see it slows way down. It still works but it doesn't have much force associated with it. Alternatively, if I increase the driving weight just a little bit, you can hear how much that sped up. So the amount of mass, the amount of force against the pulley back here, or against the gear, um, well, I suppose you could call that a pulley. That also affects the rate of the clock. So everything here is kind of in a careful balance. That's one of the limitations of this clock, that in order to be able to make it work more efficiently in a more compact space, you have to change the design. And change the design means either recalibrating weights, adding more gears, some other mechanism in order to adjust the rate of, of swing. Now you'll also note that this is not turning at once per second. It's about one and a half beats per second. Or it's, sorry, it's about one beat per one and a half seconds. And again, that's, that's simply a, fact, a function of the gear ratios. There's, there's no th nothing that says that this should be beating once per second. It's just a matter of making the hand go around the clock uh, once in 12 hours. And that is about what the, this length of rope will allow, one 12 hour cycle. Meaning each morning, each evening, you gotta, uh, you gotta put a little bit more tension in it. Or you gotta, each morning, each evening, you have to wind the weights back. And probably need to do a little bit at some point in the middle just to make sure that it doesn't run out without you noticing it. Um, I'll also note one problem with this particular clock is it's not quite in beat. You can see that this side here, if I put it up so you can see it this way, you can see that on the right it's moving further back than it is on the left. Now the, that's a function uh, of the position of the foliate on the post that is holding the pellets on the verge. So if I, if I have this here, and let's say this rope is the rod, the way to correct that is to turn the foliate one way or the other on the rod so that the beat evenly divides the, the swing of the pendulum. Unfortunately, on this particular clock, it looks like those are fairly solidly adhered, so I'm not really sure I'm gonna be able to do that. I'll have to look at that and kind of see if I can get a better idea of uh, what the attachment mechanism is, because I don't, if I break that free uh, to move it, I could end up with a bigger problem. So I'm not really sure that that's necessary. It does sometimes strike as it turns. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. 
what it's doing is wasting energy and potentially affecting the rate, but not all that much. So anyway, just a quick look at a classic Verge and Foliate clock because mechanical clock movements, especially the early ones, always just fascinate the heck out of me. Oh, one other note. Now, in tuning this particular clock, one of the important things to do is to make sure that the intercepting face of the pallets is nice and polished, and also to make sure that the uh, uh, pins are smooth and free of rust, and that the tops are rounded off just a bit so that they're dragging, not scraping, on the pallet. Uh, the goal here is to minimize friction. On this particular clock, uh, it was built with brass bushings on the pivots. So I can actually oil this and get it to move reasonably well that way. Uh, if this were simply wood on wood, then what you might do is take some hard wax, uh, like a, a, a hard paraffin, and rub it on the pivot, not on the, not on the hole, but on the actual pivot on the gear. Uh, I'm not talking melting it in. I'm just talking putting a very thin coat on the wood itself so that it uh, slides a little bit more freely uh, within its pivot hole. And this particular one, I also note, there is occasionally is some less than perfect movement out of the pivot or the uh, escape wheel here. And I believe that has to do with this particular pinion with one tooth maybe two being slightly wider than they're supposed to be so that it takes a little bit more force to get them to uh, pass on the second on the uh, yeah the second wheel uh, in and out of the mating gear teeth so uh, I fixed some of that by scraping a little bit off the surface and I'll note this for some reason is not a particularly hard wood which it really ought to be uh, oak at least, if not something a little bit more dense. Uh, but, I mean, walnut, oak, anything like that will generally work. But in lieu of brass, if you're making a wood clock, you want to make sure that the wood is not going to flex too much and is not going to wear out too quickly. Uh, take care of it, and this will last a very long time. Like I said, this particular clock was built about 1970. It looks like it had run for a fairly good period of time. There are certain wear on the pallets, which suggests to me that it was in operation for a decent period, long enough for that to happen. However, when I got it, the suspension was gone, which is why I had to put the fishing line in here. But I'm pretty happy with it. And you'll note that the connection point is just above the, uh, uh, just above the pivot hole there. And that's another point where you can put a little bit of oil on just to make sure that those don't bind up. Uh, it shouldn't be too much higher than that, otherwise the pallets won't mesh with the uh, escape wheel pins properly. So, anyway, just a quick video out of nothing more than my personal interest and maybe a benefit to anybody who runs across one of these things on how to uh, set it up and get it working properly. Alright, that's all for today.